Good evening. Uh, welcome to the second quarter on the move webinar. Uh, normally, it'd be Rich Checkin and Chris Blasey uh, hosting this event. Unfortunately, at the last second, Chris had something he had to break away and take uh, uh, pay attention to. So he's not going to be with us tonight, uh, but that's okay. We've got somebody who's larger than life who can make up for multiple personalities. Uh, and I, I think you all know who I'm talking about. I've said it before in, in leading up to this event. Uh, Mark needs no introduction, but I'm going to do a little bit of introduction anyway. Uh, he's the editor since what, 1980 of Forecasts and Strategies. He's uh, one of the uh, 20 most influential living economists uh, in this world. And, and he's starting to creep up the, the dead columnists, although he, or economists, although he doesn't uh, quite qualify yet. Um, he's, uh, <laughs> sorry, he's the editor of about 25 different books. He's spoken at numerous events, uh, impossible to even count at this point over, over the years. Uh, and, you know, a, a, with a resume like he has, uh, you'd think, okay, time to just sit back, smell the roses, take it easy. But for the last decade plus, Mark has been the producer of the greatest gathering of free minds uh, in the world, which is the Freedom Fest uh, conference that happens every year. Uh, and it would have happened every year if Nevada didn't get in the way uh, last year. Uh, but that's okay. South Dakota to the rescue this year in July. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But it is my absolute pleasure to, to welcome uh, a very important man and a good friend, Mark Skousen. Uh, welcome to On The Move. Rich, good to be with you. And you have a passion for what you do in life, Rich. <laughs> I, I tell people I was born rich, but I'm working at being wealthy, so. <laughs> good line, I like it. So Mark, we're gonna, we're gonna touch on some pretty mundane subjects here tonight. So very easy answers, you know, like yes or no. Um, not really. The, the first question I want to pose to you is, you know, and I want you to, to kind of frame it in terms of the first hundred days of uh, President Biden's administration, because uh, we're basically there right now. Um, what do you think drives an economy? Is it consumer spending? Is it business investment? Is it government stimulus? Listen to Sleepy, if you listen to Sleepy Joe, uh, assuming that really Joe Biden, I kind of wonder sometimes that they, they, they kind of prop him up and he starts speaking and he doesn't take questions and he makes a statement and then he kind of patters back alone. I think it's a little bit risky to have a very uh, elderly man who may have lost some of his marbles, you know, uh, I, I'm i not a fan of Joe Biden. Of course, I wasn't really a fan of Donald Trump either. So I, I was going to guess you, he, he's not on the Christmas card list for sure by what I've heard so far. I, actually, uh, no, but I did get to go to the Trump Christmas party in his uh, last December. Yeah. And it was wonderful. They had over a hundred live trees. I'm sure it was due to his wife's doing, but she did a wonderful job of decorating the White House. And I was there with Wayne Allen Root. We talked about him and, and his uh, his girlfriend, his fiance. Yes. Uh, and we just had a great time. Uh, but now we have a new president who, I mean, Donald Trump was a big spender. Despite his, his promise to drain the swamp, he never did, uh, but... Um, he made life more enjoyable for us business people because we were kind of left alone. We could do our thing. And then the pandemic hit. Trump didn't know what hit him in the election. And now we're faced with the Joe Biden who has never seen, I mean, he just spends money like water. Uh, tree in here, tree in there. He, he calls the bill, the infrastructure bill, $2.9 billion. And, and of course we... The United States is in many ways a third world country when it comes to infrastructure. I mean, look at our airports compared to other countries. Look at roads just in New York City falling apart and stuff. So there's really a need for fixing up our infrastructure, our roads, our highways, our bridges. 
but he's not spending the money on that. He's spending less than $200 billion on that. And the rest of it is uh, pork barrel expenditures and giving money to various vested interests. Um, well, that's, but that's not new, Mark. I mean, we saw that with the COVID uh, relief uh, uh, bills as well. I mean, we were educating Pakistanis on gender relations or, or whatever, cultural relations. I'm not sure what we're doing, but uh, that's in every bill. Um, I agree with you, though, the, a lot less of the bill is infrastructure. I don't know why you call it that when so little of it is actually devoted to infrastructure. Yeah, the, he must be doing something right. I mean, the stock market is at an all-time high, and, and uh, we are one, I'm 100% invested. You made a newsletter, which I started when the greatest president of the 20th century was elected, and that would be... Ronald Reagan, I, I guess. Ronald what, Reagan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I read Reagan for times. I, I've met all, all the presidents uh, in recent history. Um, and uh, I, I was definitely impressed with Reagan. He did a great job. Uh, but, you know, he never did uh, uh, even suggest or even propose the abolition of the Department of Education, which is a total waste of money. Mm. Um, there's so much waste in government. They're kind of irresponsible. I'll tell you, I have a graph and uh, I put it in my newsletter and in my trading services. And it's a graph showing showing debt, personal debt, uh, and business debt, corporate mm -hmm. debt. And both of them are quite uh, reasonable, quite rational. Um, it's not really growing that dramatically. In fact, many corporations have tons of cash on hand. I actually think they're in better financial shape than they've ever been. And I think they were all taught from the 2008 financial crisis that they needed to tighten their belts, uh, have a lot of cash on hand, uh, be prepared for the next crisis that might hit so that you can survive. And then of course the pandemic hit and the lockdown hit. And so the big companies that did have a lot of cash like Microsoft and Apple and, and Amazon and companies like that, they wisely build up a position. They're in really good financial shape. But the one that's totally irresponsible is government spending. So, so you have private debt rising like this, corporate personal debt rising like this. It's not out of line. And then you see this skyrocketing irresponsible government debt. And they're going to continue to do that until they have to pay the Pied Piper. And that is going to be at the time when interest rates start rising, inflation is coming back. We're already seeing it in a lot of prices. We're seeing it in speculative vehicles and the assets of uh, real estate, Bitcoin, uh, dog coin. Uh, it's just crazy, yeah. some of the stuff that's going Which on. It started there, as but, a joke. Uh, Do Dogecoin or whatever, how you ever print it. It started, started as, as a joke, joke and it's worth $40. Is it really? Yeah, worth 40 billion. That? How do we measure worth? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a crazy upside down world, as Howard Ruff would call it. You know, when we were down Investment U uh, in Florida, what, about a month or two ago, um, I made the point that, you know, if you look at the government statistics, inflation's really not here. Of course, they take out energy, they take out food, all the things that are, are going to be surging in, in uh, uh, price uh, as time goes on. Uh, but uh, I said, you know, you can still see it. You can see it at the gas pump. You can see it when you buy your tomatoes in the grocery store. And I had a lot of feedback from folks saying, oh, no, you can see it everywhere. You know, it, uh, guy said, you know, look at your can of tuna fish. It's the same size, but there's less tuna in it and more water. Take your Doritos bag. It's the same size, but look at the ounces. It's less and you're paying the same price or more. Um, so, that, you know, a lot of people are, are noticing that there is inflation out there. Um, I, I think it... Uh, you know, Janet Yellen, not too long ago, said, you know, that we're never going to have a crisis like 2000, 2008, 2009 again. Um, how can she predict we, such a thing? We did. We did in 2020. <laughs> and we're paying the price for it very heavily. Well, you started your question by asking what drives the economy. And of yeah. course, Biden and Yellen and so on, they're Keynesian. They follow, follow Keynesian economics. And so they think the consumers, the the kingpin 
and government spending. It, it's the consumer. You need to keep the consumer happy. So this is why we're sending all this money, cash, to consumers, and they're hoping that they'll go out and spend it. Instead, what they're doing is, since they don't need the money, they're investing it in the stock market, and the stock market's going through the roof. So there's creating a lot of distortions in that respect. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really the business. You can't have... You can't have the economy really recovering until the business sector recovers. Yes, you can give people a lot of money, but if they're not going to produce products, all you're going to get is inflation. And that's what you're seeing, uh, although the technology has done a great job. I'll take my hat off to the entrepreneurs who've created Zoom, which were on. Yep. And uh, I, I think a year or two ago, we couldn't even do this and have all the things that do on it. We can do poll questions. Uh, I mean, I have Zoom, my class, which I just finished uh, today before getting together with you. And we, you know, I got 30 students and we can ask them poll questions. We can do breakout sessions where they all divide up and we do it automatically. Uh, it's, it's really quite exciting, the technology that's taken place. So there is a lot of genuine economic growth higher standard of living that we're enjoying uh the government just needs to get out of the way and allow business because business is key it's not the consumer the consumer doesn't even know what they want they didn't know they wanted this zoom thing until it was created they didn't know that you you wanted the, you know you wanted the phone before it was created i mean steve jobs created this because he said i think this would be a really neat gadget well you know Obviously, I think we're both in agreement. It's not the government that, that's going to generate growth. Uh, I, I saw a statistic. I wish I could have found it and pulled it up before tonight. We were talking about um, the what a dollar of government spending used to generate in terms of growth and what it does now. It actually Every dollar spent actually loses money now, whereas in the past it did used to generate some growth. Um, but your point is valid. If you know, you're not creating more demand um, for products, et cetera. So there's a finite number of products out there. You're expanding the money supply astronomically like we did last year. I think, what, a 25% increase the most since 1943. Um, and that's just more dollars chasing a finite number of goods and services. Nothing can happen but for the prices to go up eventually. So I'm a follower of the Austrian School of Economics. We're actually celebrating the 150th anniversary of the publication of, of the beginning of the Austrian School of Economics with Kringer. And Mengele's book, The Principles of Economics, or the, the uh, made the argument that how do you how do you measure the standard thing? And most economists say, well, you look at the average wage, and if the wage is going up, you've increased your standing of living. Manger looked at quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. QQ and the way I call it, quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. And generally speaking, over the last 50 years, over the last 100 years, you've had a tremendous increase in the quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. Almost yeah. everything you have, you have more variety. We look at the number of shampoos and toothpaste and apples and fruits and you know one might say like too many choices but okay too many choices <laughs> I, I tell my students i said do you ever get the same toothpaste twice uh, it's just or the shampoo twice uh, but uh that's the great thing about the private sector um one of the points uh, my own creations it's kind of my nobel prize winning work is uh in the creation of, of gross output go and gross output is the measure of spending at all stages of production. And a lot of people don't know this, but GDP measures only the final stage, the finished product. And when you, when you look at just the finished product, 70% of it is, is consumer spending. So that's where you get this myth that consumer spending drives the economy. Mm -hmm. And the second biggest sector is government. And then business, the poor third. So this is why there's a focus on government and, and, and consumer spending as the key to economic growth. But if you look at gross output, because GDP leaves out the supply chain, if you add the B2B spending in the supply chain, turns out that business spending is actually uh, the largest sector in the economy. It's over 60% of total spending in the economy. 
consumption is less than a third and government's only 8%. So now seeing the key indicators that you have to encourage entrepreneurship, saving, investing, uh, the stock market, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, and it all happens on the supply side of, of the equation. So is Joe Biden doing that? Well, he's giving consumers a bunch of checks, government's running huge deficits, and he wants to raise taxes on business, so that can't be good. So there's a lot of reasons why, uh, while the stock market is really doing well, and I think that's largely because of the easy money policies of the Federal Reserve, no tax increases have posed yet. But if you get tax increases, on top of a tight money policy where the Fed says, oh, enough inflation here, interest rates are rising, we have to remove the punch bowl, uh, watch out, that's when you're gonna get a bear market, that's when you're going to get um, a recession. And so um, we're, we're looking for the time when that happens. For an Austrian economist, we look at the structure of interest rates and so that means if short-term interest rates are the Fed start raising the discount and it's higher than the long-term rate, that's the danger sign. That's when we're gonna face recession in a bear market. Till that comes, I'm bullish on stocks, not bonds so much, but stocks, technology, Bitcoin, gold, all of those things. See, I, I, I've got two, two points there to add. I, I would argue, or I have argued that we have seen inflation from the stimulus in 2008, 2009. A lot of people say it never materialized. I think you're looking at it in the stock market every day. I think that's where we're seeing price inflation with these valuations that are what, three times historical values. Um, some companies are just you know, going through the roof in terms of valuations and they don't, they don't have never turned a profit. Um, you know, at, at some point you, you got to deliver, right? Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, talking about uh, the stimulus and what that does. Uh, in our firm, you know, we're in a growth cycle. We're in a bull market for precious metals. It's fledgling, it's early, but we're in one. So as a, as a metals dealer, I'm looking to hire, right? So it took us four months to find a qualified candidate. Um, no, it, it took less than that to find a qualified candidate. It took four months to get one in the door, interview and actually take a job. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, when, when the Fed is adding to the state unemployment and they're extending it out to 26 months and they're getting stimmy checks along the way, why on earth would I go to work? I could sit home and collect $50,000 and do not a thing. Um, and I think that's really stymieing business. It's stymieing development and it's having adverse effect in the long term of growing an economy. Creation is a, is a real concern. Uh, em employment numbers, you gotta watch those very carefully. The people on unemployment compensation because they've been laid off. Uh, all of those factors are really important. And of course, maybe Rich, you need, just need just need to pay for it to get the, get those employees. Well, That's what the more? government wants you to do, right? <laughs> of it's, course. It's, well, face, uh, it, if I could create money out of thin air, Mark, I would do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, you know, I, I I don't think what's going on here is actually helpful in the long term. I, I've been arguing as well lately that you know you're going to see the taxation. I, I I think it's a foregone conclusion that is coming, and that is a direct uh, assault on your your purchasing power, your your standard of living, et cetera. Um, but even more so, you're going to mm -hmm. see that insidious tax uh, come about. Uh, when all these diluted dollars uh, basically lessen the purchasing power of every dollar in your pocket, uh, uh, in your bank account, in your 401k, in your home, you know? Yeah, there's two, uh, two forms of taxation. Uh, I teach the theory of taxation at my university, and we violate these principles all the time, but uh, taxation through levies on the income tax, on real estate taxes, sales taxes, all the different kinds of taxes. Now they're even talking about a wealth tax, which is extremely dangerous. The wealth tax is your worst kind of tax because it requires, it takes, it makes everyone a criminal because you have to list all of your assets, you lose privacy. And uh, 
it's a very dangerous type of uh, tax to go down and many have tried it and then stopped using it because it made everyone a criminal because uh, you don't want to have to reveal the gold and silver coins that you purchase privately, but it's all an asset, right? So it all mm -hmm. has to be weighed in. Uh, so taxes, there's a tendency to undertax and to inflate the money supply. The inflating the money supply is a way of taxing everybody. It does have that benefit. If you want to tax everybody, it is the way to go. And in fact, in fact, Benjamin Franklin, uh, you know, he invented a lot of things. And one of the things he liked about inflation was that it forced those farmers who were tax protesters and tax evaders out in Western Pennsylvania, he forced them to pay for the war. How? By uh, depreciating the currency. So they, they would lose 10% uh, a year or what have you. And that's a government's way of confiscating your wealth to pay for, in this case, the American Revolution. So he actually has a wonderful paragraph about all the, the wonders of inflation, the benefits of inflation, because it, it forced these tax protesters and tax evaders they had to pay one way or another. But one of the problems with the but some theory, of us pay both ways. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I pay a very fairly high tax rate myself. Anybody who's successful pays the maximum tax rate unless you have some scheme to put your money. And there, there are legitimate tax shelters and that sort of thing. I've, I've tried every, every one of them. <laughs> we li I lived in the Bahamas for two years and we saved so much money in taxes legitimately. And we paid for a flat in London for cash. They couldn't believe it. Um, so, uh, but in the theory of taxation, the principle is the benefit principle. If you benefit from government, you should pay for it. Well, how much should you pay? I mean, if the government, you, you sell a, a, a gold coin for a profit or you sell a stock for a profit, let's say you've made a Maybe you've doubled your money in gold. Maybe you've doubled your money in Apple stock, Facebook, or Amazon. How much you benefited from the fact that the government has a system of laws. It has a justice system. It has a, it, it has a national defense. Uh, it, it provides for local roads and that sort of thing. So you benefit from that. So what percent of that profit that you made that you took all the risk on, how much of that give back to the government? Rich, and I tell students this, so what would be a legitimate amount uh, that you should pay to the government for the privilege of having a stable monetary and fiscal system so that you actually take profits and for the benefits of those profits? What percent? I don't know, but I, I know that looking back uh, historically that one of the best models out there was probably Hong Kong in terms of uh, generating growth and uh, building their economy. Um, I wanna say they had what, a 15% flat tax, something along those yes, lines? Yes, they had a 15% flat tax on income only and no tax on capital gains, interest and dividends. Now saying investors do benefit. So I think, I think they should pay a tax, but it shouldn't be the current 20, 24%. And by to eliminate the break completely for long-term gains. Uh, yeah. So the rate would go up to 36 or 50% when you add in. I mean, is that a legitimate amount? No, that's confiscatory. It's totally unrelated to the benefit. I think three or 4% is all they should get. Yeah. That would be that would be reasonable. And it wouldn't really distort the capital structure. So I'm the one who teaches this proper uh, cardinal principles of taxation. And uh, to the, 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 the most pernicious argument in favor of taxation is the ability to pay. If you have the ability to pay, you should pay more. No, that's the benefit principle is the only legitimate argument for uh, a certain level of taxation. I tend to agree with that. And you, you can see that play out. You know, uh, there's tons of examples right now. Uh, people are leaving New York in droves. They're leaving California. They're leaving all these high tax jurisdictions. My problem with taxation is it's not tied 
like you said, to the benefit principle or, or, or anything along those lines. Basically, it is just uh, the way for fiscally irresponsible politicians to pay for what they should have said no to in the first place. You know, we all have to balance our checkbooks. And the reason to raise my, raise my taxes is not because you screwed up in your job of being a goose, good steward of the state budget or the federal budget or the county budget. Um, that's, I shouldn't be taxed because you can't do your job well. Yeah, and uh, I do like the fact that we have uh, tax competition. So every state has a different tax and Florida has no income tax at all. And that's a big attraction. Now, of course, they have real estate taxes that are substantially. I mean, I live out here in California. I'm doing this interview with you in our home in California. California has something that's cheap. Do you know what it is? What? It's real estate taxes. They're oh, okay. relatively, you know, because there's only one percent of uh, the value of your property. Uh, and Prop 13 that was passed in the late 70s is still in place, wow. but the gasoline tax, the sales tax, the income tax, uh, all Keeps these rising. different taxes <laughs> are, uh, make up for this low real estate tax. Gotcha. Well, <laughs> I, I'm gonna go ahead and shift gears here a little bit. Um, I've got, I wanna get your thoughts on, on something else, you know, with the, the rise of the, the AOCs and that whole class of new Congress people, I'm not sure what we're supposed to call them now, uh, but the, all the new Congress people, uh, basically there's uh, been increased talk all across the country uh, at every level about uh, more socialism. Uh, here in the United States. Uh, we were the bastion of capitalism. Uh, and uh, everybody's basically saying capitalism failed, capitalism is bad. Uh, we need to a uh, kinder, more gentler approach. We have to take care of the earth and each other and socialism is the way to go. So I'll pose this question to you. Um, why does or does socialism <coughs> always fail? Uh, and should investors uh, as they're looking for investment opportunities around the world uh, or around the country, should they seek out or avoid countries with high levels of socialism uh, when, they, when they make these decisions for their investments? Well, first of all, I would say that the AOCs of the world and Elizabeth Warren and, and Bernie Sanders and these people who call themselves socialists, uh, they're talking about a, a milder form of socialism. None of them, except the old hardcore Soviet central planning model where the government owns everything and they try to run the airlines and they try to uh, build uh, cars. And we, we all saw how the Soviet Union failed miserably in that system. And even Bernie Sanders and AOC, they have enough of no, uh, history to know that that didn't work. So they're more into regulatory. Can I interrupt uh, you though? Did, didn't President Barack Obama say that you didn't build that? We did? Yes. And, and so what, what he's saying is not, not that the government built it, but we played a significant role and you need to all pay taxes and you need to uh, uh, thank you, thank the government for their, their role. And without the government, we would have serious problems. And, and that's that a point you made earlier in terms of the benefit analysis for taxes. Right, right, exactly. So th that's, that's understandable. But the danger, as I see it, is excessive regulation and excessive taxation. That's where they're headed. Uh, and, and so it's not the normal, let's nationalize everything, let's confiscate everything uh, and try to run everything uh, themselves. So here's how I uh, approach this problem with students, because I teach students and I give speeches all around the world. And, and so I say, so I have a talk called what's better than democratic socialism? Because that's what they find appealing is this idea of uh, free medical care, free college tuition. Uh, let the rich, you know, the rich didn't really earn all of this, so we need to tax them and not really get their incentives by raising taxes to pay for all this free stuff. Because these are all very, I mean, ed, a high a college education and <clears throat> medical services 
are very valuable products and services, and they're not free. Somebody has to pay for them. And what they're saying is, let the rich people pay it, let the taxpayer pay it, uh, and, and those of, of us who are vulnerable, we, we don't pay for it. So that's their basic uh, modus operandi. So what I do is I write up on the board when I speak to these groups, these students, and I say, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. How many of you think this is an ideal statement, a statement of the ideal society? And I can always get a vast majority of students to say, yeah, that sounds really reasonable. Everybody pitches in and works hard, and then you get what you need. I said, so students, I always wear a hat. So I said, let's put on our economics hat, and let's analyze this statement and see if it really does make any sense economically. So I said, so what are your needs? Students, how much do you need to live on? And it's kind of an exercise because. In, when I gave this at Hillsdale College, they said, ah, oh, 30,000 a year, that would be enough for me to take care of all my needs. In California, <laughs> they said 70, minimum at least $70,000 they needed to, to enjoy a comfortable life, to fulfill their needs. Hmm. And I said, so here's the question. What happens when you earn more than $70,000? Where does that money go into this kind of society? And of course, the answer is, it's taken from you and put into a common pot to help those who don't earn enough to fulfill their needs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who don't earn $70,000 a year. So you put it into this. So you, so the, the money that you earn beyond 70,000. So I said, what kind of incentive do you have to work more than to earn more than $70,000 a year? That's the and of course thing. there is not. It's a hundred. What, what drives you to want to yearn to reach for something else if it's just given to you? We we're just talking about the stimmy checks. Why would I go to work if I could just sit home and collect fifty thousand dollars a year? You're yeah, you're moving a little bit ahead of me. I'm sorry. What I'm talking <laughs> about is somebody who earns one hundred and fifty thousand. What happens to that additional uh, eighty thousand dollars? And of course, it's taken away from you. Yeah. So I said, what's the marginal tax rate under this kind of system? And it dawns on the students, oh, this is a 100% marginal tax rate. They're taking it all. You're not left with anything except the 70000 that you need. <clears throat> and then I said, well, so what about people who earn $30,000 a year? What incentive do they have to move it up to 70000 and pay for it? Well, they don't have any because it's given to them yeah. from the surplus from people who earn more than 70000 So it's all about incentives. That's what economics is all about. And this system is strongly against any incentive. It's a disincentive to work hard. And this is why socialism always fails. And it's like a light goes on. And so the 80% of students who supported democratic capitalism, they're now shifting over. They're not completely shifting over. Why? Because you have to provide an alternative. And what is the alternative? You can't get rid of a bad idea unless you replace it with a good idea. You can't just criticize. And we're really good at criticizing. We've been criticizing Biden and all this stuff. But for those who want Medicare for all and free tuition and all this sort of thing, you gotta provide an alternative. And, I, and the alternative I give them is called democratic capitalism. And what is democratic capitalism? Democratic capitalism is where you share the wealth, you have a stakeholder philosophy, and so it's a win, 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 win situation for all of the stakeholders, the workers, the investors, the executives, the CEO, the suppliers, the customers, everybody benefits. This is the John Mackey Whole Foods approach, who's a co-ambassador to Freedom Fest, by the way, and will be yep. one of our keynote speakers. You've got to hear this guy. He has a revolutionary model called conscious capitalism. And so... I tell them the Ford $5 a day story. And the Ford $5 day, dollar a day story is the first example where a major corporation who was making record profits decided to share the wealth with his workers. And he overnight more than doubled the wages of the workers and uh, from $2 a day to $5 a day. Thus, it's called the $5 a day story. <coughs> and he made headline news in all the newspapers, including the New York Times. Ford 
doubles, more than double salary to $5 a day, gives a huge bonus to all of his workers and destroyed Marxism. Marxists had two arguments against capitalism, two of them, and he destroyed them all in one announcement, the $5 a day. One is the case against exploitation, that capitalists just exploited their workers and never shared the wealth. Hmm. He obviously violated that rule. Number two is alienation. Workers were had to produce eight hours a day or 10 hours a day products they weren't able to use, like the Model T, they couldn't afford it. Now at $5 a day, they finally could afford it. So in one fell swoop, Ford's $5 a day story destroyed the two arguments against Marxism. And that's why Marxism has never really caught on in America. <clears throat> and then I showed the charts of Microsoft and Home Depot and other companies that have offered stock options to, to all of their employees. And so 12,000 Microsoft workers, employees, including secretaries have become multimillionaires <clears throat> because Bill Gates shared the wealth. So that's what I call democratic capitalism. And so 80% of my students go from a, a wanting democratic socialism, shift all the way over, where 80% want now are in favor of democratic capitalism. They become little capitalists and entrepreneurs. There's still that 20% you can't change no matter what. But still, that's a pretty, it's a really significant change. And I do this on the $15 minimum wage law. I do this on consumer spending, what drives the economy, consumer business. I can switch business people from here over to here. And I do it with my textbook, Economic Logic. So if anybody's interested, they can check out my books that I've written. I have two, I have three textbooks, Economic Logic, the Making of Modern Economics, and a Viennese Waltz Down Wall Street for investors, for people. And if they go to skousenbooks.com, skousenbooks.com, uh, they can get more information on all my books. Because I'm on a mission to teach sound economics, sound investing to uh, students and to adults. Uh, Mark, I've known you now 25 years. Um, I, I can't remember a time when we got together where I didn't learn something right even if it's relearning something i forgot that you told me 20 you know 20 years ago um it's funny you're Thank talking you. about the socialism and, and everything's provided for so when we had our 30th year anniversary here at night uh asi back in uh 2012 uh we had a big conference here at the hilton next door uh we brought in 200 250 people and we had a bunch of our friends speaking at the conference as well uh one of which was uh uh one of the uh reps with at the time yuska asset management from Yuska Bank in uh, Copenhagen. And we were driving to dinner after the, the conference and I was with one of the young guys from, from the asset management team. And I asked him, I said, so why is it that every year when they do these polls, Denmark comes out as one of the happiest countries on earth, if not the happiest countries on earth? And he said, you know, it's because everything is taken care of. You know, and I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, you know, if, if I get hurt, right, I go to the hospital, they take care of me, stitch me back together, do whatever, and it doesn't cost me anything. I'm like, oh, that's, that's so interesting. Just out of curiosity, how much do you get taxed on a per annum, uh, per annum basis? And he says, well, about 62 to 66% of his salary goes to the government. And I'm like, huh, it's all free, is it? You know, you, it gets back to if, if you pay taxes and the government provides something that you can't yourself, that you're willing to, to have provided, then I guess it's worthwhile. It's like going into a store and buying something that you want or need. Uh, wonderful. But I don't think they all work like that. I think most of them get back to what I described earlier as being fiscally, fiscally irresponsible and then handing me the bill for their incompetence. So have you ever been to Denmark? I have, yes. <clears throat> There's not a lot to do there. There's not a lot. You can bike. <laughs> you, need, you need to get out of Denmark to enjoy life to the fullest. They're, they're just, uh, <clears throat> they're naive in their happiness. <laughs> Well, and, and I mean, I don't know, I haven't done a lot of study and I don't know how much ingenuity and creativity and whatnot comes out of Denmark and, and Danish people chime in, you know, let me know if I'm missing well, they're something. Also, they're also uh, 
heavily involved in international trade. Yes. Uh, yes. And a lot of money is made. So even though they pay a 60% tax rate inside Denmark, they have all kinds of ways of minimizing taxes through international, through foreign trade, a lot more than the United States. Yeah. There's probably a lot of factors involved uh, in, in the Scandinavian happiness uh, level. So, so how do we communicate to the folks that don't know any better that are, you know, coming up through the ranks and they're saying, hey, you know what, capitalism isn't working. I don't like what's been going on for, for basically my adult life or my young adult life or whatever. Uh, and maybe socialism is the answer. You know, how, how do we educate them about some of the things like Margaret Thatcher said, you know, socialism's great until you run out of other people's money, right? Um, or, you know, you just look at the real world examples of Venezuela. Uh, Russia, et cetera, uh, where you're right. It, it really has never succeeded for a significant period of time. How, how do we educate them? Other than send them to your class at Chapman. Yeah, yeah, well, and, and my books are available for everybody uh, to, to learn from that. But I do think that uh, uh, some kind of a uh, uh, basic uh, assisting people who, who are uh, the capitalist system, we're, nothing is guaranteed in that system. You can be off uh, due to technology. And why did Donald Trump win? Because he, he uh, spoke to the people who had, who had suffered as a result of technology and foreign competition. Uh, he really went into that and people were disturbed. Uh, they were troubled by that. You know, change is, we need to teach people that change is not necessarily bad, that you need to sometimes go through those kind of struggles and you're a better person. You know, uh, he that, uh, uh, it's just common sense that that change is inevitable and we need to adjust it. It's, it's the growing up process that we go through uh, and people are afraid of that. And so I think an education is, is really helpful in that regard. And we also need to see the benefits of capitalism a lot better. I think we do a poor job of educating people on, on the benefits of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, John Stossel had a wonderful video uh, one time where he talked about how uh, Akron, Ohio, for example, was in the Rust Belt and, and rubber was competition destroyed the rubber industry uh, in Akron, Ohio, and the city fathers recognized that, and they brought in new technologies, companies, and now Akron, Ohio is flourishing. Uh, so you went through that transition period, but you're better off because of it, and the people that, that had the, the jobs working for rubber or steel or cars or what have you now have better jobs that are much more fulfilling uh, and they, they speak in, in favor of that. So if we can teach that somehow there's, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch and that, uh, it, it, you know, there's always a, a, a feel in a mousetrap, right? No. There's always free cheese in a mousetrap. That's the old <laughs> saying. Yeah. Now, uh, I know you uh, uh, write a newsletter with a good friend, a mutual friend, uh, Jim Woods, who will also be at Freedom Fest, right? Um, one of the things yes. I, I like the, in Jim's writing is he, he doesn't um, – He's obviously a big believer in capitalism, as are you and as am I, uh, but he always re reminds people of what we have is a result of capitalism and we should be incredibly thankful because we're incredibly blessed, you know, so you look at, you know, what Microsoft did to just change the world that doesn't come about without some sort of incentive some sort of profit motive uh etc and you know bill gates gets to be an incredible philanthropist now because um he had the foresight and he created something that people need it solved needs uh and uh created new ones and solved them too right uh but uh you know it's important to look back at a lot of the variety of choices that we have of products the quality 
something and variety. I forget what it was from earlier. Yeah, quantity, quality, and variety. You know, part of that is because of capitalism. It, it created that, that, or it, it fertilized the soil so that it could all grow, right? Well, Andrew Carnegie had a really great statement. He says, capitalism is all about turning luxuries into necessities. We've certainly seen that even with the ballpoint pen that used to cost $500 is now given away for free. Yeah. Uh, the cell phone, uh, the HD TV, uh, the computers. Uh, there's so many examples of things where wealthy people uh, were the initial, in, uh, tr they tried out these new products because only wealthy people could afford them. And eventually they got the price down so that everybody could buy it. Uh, it's really valuable to show that capitalism is the uh, is the main engine that eliminates poverty. Uh, John Mackey has a wonderful chapter on on the benefits of capitalism, but it's only going to work if you emphasize the democratic capitalism model. And uh, we've definitely seen an improvement in, in the way business uh, performs and gets everyone involved into the stakeholder philosophy. And the more we preach that, the more, the happier people will be about capitalism because everybody's benefiting. If everybody benefits, they love it. You know, it's only, you're only a socialist uh, in your youth uh, because you're, you're not earning a living and, and you're, you're in a socialist environment where everybody is paying your, your education, your, uh, you know, your parents are paying for it, your business is paying for it. It's not often that you pay for everything on your education. But once you get out in the real world and start working and so forth, if you see the fruits of capitalism and you're not taken advantage of by your uh, cap, by the firm, uh, you're going to be more and more a supporter of that system. That's what we really need. We need more and more of the stakeholder democratic capitalism, what John Mackey calls conscious capitalism. I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, I, I hate that moniker that capitalists are greedy people. Uh, I, I know many very successful capitalists who are opposite of that. Um, you know, and, and if you need any proof that capitalism works and it helps not just here but all over the world every year the economist puts out the statistics right for for the year uh and they cover every category you know that imaginable uh and one of them is charitable giving um and take a look who is always number one on that chart in terms of charitable giving it's the united states uh and number two you can't even see them in the rearview mirror in terms of the sheer volume of of gifting that goes on. Yeah, there's a great sermon. I think that's because we're largely a Christian nation and the Christians are famous for their charitable works and to do good to the good, you know, the good Samaritan uh, par uh, story, that kind of thing, the parable of the good Samaritan. Um, and uh, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist uh, school, uh, Methodist church, uh, gave the very pro-wealth sermon wealth back in 1741. It's called the Sermon on Wealth, and he said there's 10 principles to, the, uh, to uh, happiness, uh, material happiness in this world. He said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all. Now, he didn't say spend all you can. We've added a full and spend all you can, which it makes it hard to save all to you can. One. That gets if you're a government yeah, but, that gets bumped to number one. Spend all you can, don't yeah. hurt anything. Uh, anyway, but you know it, it is cool though that he emphasized give all you can. It was kind of for a church to do that, but I think a lot of people took that to heart. And there's no question in France and other countries they say, well, the government takes care of equitable giving and taking care of the poor and all that sort of thing. That's not our responsibility. So Wouldn't the you United rather States make that choice. Wouldn't you rather make that choice? Uh, as to yeah, who, and I uh, think that's a like great thing about the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, we've got a couple questions. I'm going to take a look. If anybody listening uh, wants to share some questions with us, by all means, just go ahead and type them in. I have uh, a couple questions that were sent in ahead of time. 
Um, the first one, I promised Neil I would get to this. Uh, it was a great question. He sent it in like a week ago. He says, in the coming months and years ahead, do you think silver will have a larger upside than gold? And do you think it will pass its former all-time high? And I know I have an opinion, but Mark, you're our guest. I'm going to throw it to you and see what you uh, It's funny, though, because I've been around a lot. I remember when it hit $50 an ounce back in 1980 due to the uh, Hunt, Hunt Brothers attempt to corner the silver market. Mm -hmm. And then it collapsed and went all the way back down to four or five bucks and then hit $50 again in 2011 very briefly then collapsed again down to 11 bucks and now it's back up to 25 or 26 dollars an ounce so it could easily double to 50 but it needs to get into that momentum phase which silver has done twice now uh, gold also needs to hit new highs so it needs to go over 2000 i think once gold goes over 2000 dollars you can see silver going in the 30s and 40s and then hit 50 again but it's very cyclical uh, more than gold. It's more of an industrial metal and it's like copper in that respect, but it also has a great monetary history. And of course, I'm, I'm a big fan of the silver dollar. As you know, the American Eagle uh, is the symbol at Freedom Fest and we encourage everybody to buy a silver dollar. Your guys are going to be there if you have a bunch of silver dollars. We have 3,000 people coming for Freedom Fest. And then, of course, I have I carry with me a gold coin as well. This is the Mexican 50 peso gold coin, which is about the same size as the silver dollar, 1.2 ounces of, of gold in here. But yes, I think the silver dollar, silver is more volatile. It's more of an industrial metal. So yes, it can outperform uh, gold. And in fact, I think it has this year, it's slightly better than, than, than gold. Yeah, la I mean, last year it doubled gold's uh, uh, growth. It was up about twenty or forty-eight percent versus gold at twenty twenty-four. Um, this year, both metals are down. Uh, but today's a good example. You know, we've had a couple days of gold moving up here, reasserting its role as a hedge against inflation and 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 uh, a hedge against the stock market. Uh, you know, with the the pullback over the past couple days, I think gold was up what uh, half a percent to three quarters of a percent today. Silver was up two and a half. Um, so it has that kind of potential. Gold's the leader. Silver follows. I fully expect through the life of this bull market for silver to outpace gold. Uh, not in price, you know, absolute price, but percentage gain. Um, I think the $50 in the 80s was a bit fabricated by the Hunt brothers and the Fabri uh, Arab sheiks. I don't think it gets to 50 if they didn't have that role in the market back then, if it was just left up to market forces. I think the last bull market getting the $50 was a more realistic uh, market driven price. And, you know, we tend to see two to three times the previous high, at least that's what we've seen with gold. I would expect something similar with silver by the end of this bull market as possible, whether it gets there or not. Yeah, yeah Richard, there's another factor and that is that uh, Bitcoin has struggled recently and that has been the leader as an inflation hedge. I mean, Kathy Woods at ARC Innovation and other analysts feel that Bitcoin replaced gold as and silver as the inflation hedge. And that's true to some extent, but Lately, since Bitcoin has already made its big move, uh, then people are looking for alternatives and gold and silver are really good choices. So that, it's the place to be right now. So we're going to have a big debate and I'm going to get to freedom uh, yes. next, but we're going to have a very big debate about Bitcoin versus gold. And, you know, going back and forth at and Freedom Fest. Here, I, at Freedom Fest. So I, I, um, I keep hearing that Bitcoin has been an incredible hedge to inflation, um, but I, I don't believe it has. I mean, if you look at gold and, and the, people are also saying gold uh, buyers are fleeing to Bitcoin. I don't see that either. Demand for gold is the highest we've seen in five to 10 years. It's off the charts. The price may not indicate that. But if you look at gold as an inflation hedge, it's doing its job all along, steady eddy, if you will. Uh, Bitcoin is not. It's actually tracking the stock market as opposed to being an, uh, an inflation hedge. Uh, and 
My problem is I think people are confusing a higher price for a hedge for inflation. The only reason I think Bitcoin has a high price is it's a speculation. That's what I maintain. Um, it is not a hedge. It's not the new gold until it starts acting like the new gold. It's not. It is. You can't buy it as a speculation and call it a hedge. That's my problem with Bitcoin. Sure, and, and I, I understand that perfectly, but I will say that uh, gold and silver in, in particular have actually been uh, pro-cyclical with the stock market. When the stock market's up, gold and silver are up too, generally speaking. Now, there, uh, I think some exception uh, with the dollar, the dollar is really a key factor here. Uh, the dollar was quite strong after Biden got elected. Who knows uh, why? Big time. And, and into for the gold. first three months, in the in the first three months, the dollar was strong. And of course, gold and silver are quoted in dollars, as is oil. But in particular, gold did not do well against the dollar. But since April fourth, first, no fooling, gold. Uh, the dollar has been showing a lot of weakness. And gold has taken off. So I think there is still that strong reverse correlation between the dollar and gold and silver. No question. And, you know, we were kidding early on about this plant in the back and how I was making the argument that gold is green. Uh, and of course, when you say that these days, everybody thinks, well, how is gold, you know, good for the uh, environment? Um, the way I look at it is with gold, you can buy a lot of greenbacks. And uh, the more they expand the money supply, the greener gold gets, right? Um, and that's been true for millennia. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Freedom Fest. We only got a couple minutes here before we got to break away. Um, I don't see any other open questions. I had a couple. We can get back to folks with that in our follow-up email uh, with the webinar. But um, greatest gathering of free minds. You know, Mark, we wouldn't miss it for the world. If it's on, we're there. Uh, really glad to take a big role in it this year. Uh, we're going to be exhibiting. We're going to have Silver Eagles for folks to buy, to hold up. Fantastic. Show, show your strength for hard money. Um, um, we're going to uh, be in that Bitcoin versus gold debate. I've got a workshop where I'll talk a little bit about supply squeezes, which has been going on the past few years. But you've got so much more going on. Can give us some of the highlights of Freedom Fest in July in South Dakota. I'll just say that uh, Freedom Fest, we've been doing it for 14 years since, since 2007. And for the first time, we have 14 years in Las Vegas. For the first time, we moved out of lockdown in the imperial governor. I mean, it was just insane how we lost our liberties so quickly last year. And uh, we're not rewarding Las Vegas uh, for what they did to us. We're punishing them and moving out of Las Vegas to the middle of the country, to the freest state in the union, South Dakota. And Mount Rushmore is such a magnet. People, you cannot believe we have uh, over 2,100 people have already planning to be there, including speakers and exhibitors. We have That's more exhibitors. 700 than more ever. just in the past month, Mark. It was like 1,400 when we talked a month ago. Yeah. No, we are growing extremely fast. We're going to have our biggest crowd ever. And if you haven't been to a Freedom Fest, you are in for a treat because. There is buzz there that you will not believe. You will feel a sense of belonging like never before. And this is the attraction of Freedom Fest. So it's an intellectual feast. We have a three-day investment conference that you're involved with. And we have lots of top speakers from all over the country. Uh, we have uh, authors. We have professors. We have economists, we have our political leaders. Governor Christy Nome will bear no reception. Um, we have health, health experts like John Mackey and Dr. Drew. Um, we have comedians. Uh, we, have, we have the Anthem Film Festival, yes. which is going to be in the uh, Elk Theater, which is the, an historic theater in Rapid City. Uh, the Alex Johnson Hotel has been the host of six presidents. We just visited there and it's just extremely exciting what is happening there. So we're gonna have over 200 speakers on every topic imaginable. We're gonna have lots of debates. We have our mock trial. We're gonna put the pandemic and the, lock, and the lockdown on trial. Uh, it's just going to be a wonderful event. So if people go to freedomfest.com and get more information 
on the conference and sign up now because our hotels are just getting packed. It's not Vegas. So there's lots of different hotels that you have to choose from, but most of our hotels are already filled up. And so uh, you need to move on this quickly if you want to join us. The, the dates mark uh, third week of July. Yep. July 21st through the 24th in Rapid City, South Dakota. And freedomfest.com is the website. And we're going to make it super easy on everybody listening to this webinar. And, you know, as always happens, people can't make it for whatever reason. They have a conflict. We're going to send every registered attendee a copy of this webinar. Uh, should go out tomorrow. And along with that email, you will have a registration button for Freedom Fest in there. Uh, we're going to make it super simple. Just wait for the email, click on the button, and join us. Uh, I've gone to every one that I could uh, for the past you know, decade or so. Michael's been there from the start uh, for the very first one. And it's one of those events that we look forward to every year. Uh, if you wanna recharge, uh, share ideas, um, and they're not all gonna be your ideas. I mean, you're gonna hear opposing views, et cetera. Uh, well, and I think debate. that's, yeah. and we're not gonna censor anybody, are we, Mark? I think, I think hearing opposing views analyzing situations and thinking critically for yourself is lacking right now. And it's refreshing yeah. to see it at Freedom Fest every year. Rich, we have, uh, we have a dozen uh, debates that are going on, uh, debates on religion, on Bitcoin versus gold, uh, Murray Rothbard, Conceived in Liberty. We're gonna talk about his book. We also have a wonderful discussion on what, what four economists belong on Mount Rushmore and also do the four presidents that are on Mount Rushmore, are they the ones who ought to be on Mount Rushmore or should Calvin Coolidge or Ronald Reagan be on there? So that's going to be a fun discussion. Let me mention one other thing that you might be interested in knowing. Um, in, in two years ago, I gave a penny stock recommendation, actual penny stock that tripled in value. And I gave that recommendation to our, all the attendees at the, uh, Freedom Fest in 2019. I'm going to do it again. I have a source of a deeply undervalued penny stock, and we're going to recommend that there. So that would be a good encouragement for people to come uh, to this year's conference, because I will be recommending that, and I'm not going to tell anybody else about it. Uh, so it will be pretty exciting to get involved in that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I encourage you all to attend. It is worth the trip. If you haven't been, you need to. If you've been there, you don't need to hear it from me. I know you're going back. So, uh, Mark, just some closing thoughts. We're going to move on here. We're, we're past the hour, Mark. I promised you an hour. Promised yep. the, the listeners an hour. But just some parting thoughts uh, on, on some of the stuff we talked about or, or anything regarding the current state of affairs. Well, I think we're, we're living in some times where we can feel, you know, we feel very comfortable right now with the stock at an all time high and gold and silver moving back up and, and we can, but we don't want to sit on our laurels because that's going to change. It's not going to be every day that the stock market's hitting new highs. There's going to be a time when the stock market uh, has a sharp sell off and it could be a, another uh, major bear market, a crash or what have you, it's, it's hard to predict what these things are, but we're bringing together the best and the brightest at Freedom Fest. And what you're doing is the freedom movement, Rich, with your company and, and, and Michael and so on. It's just, it's just great to be with family and we need to stick together because as Ben Franklin says, we either hang together or we hang separately and we don't want to do that. And I always end my, uh, my voice, uh, voice message, my hotline uh, that I send out, I, I say, uh, just remember, fellow free marketeers, A-E-I-O-U. <laughs> and and uh, if you know what that means, I want you to go ahead and uh, yeah, respond to the email and let me know your thoughts. I'll let you know if you got it right or not. I'm not going to divulge it on the air. I, I, Mark, a wonderful thank you to you for, for uh, joining us here today. I will tell you, I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, you know, my cup is always either half full or running over. It's never half empty the way I see things. Good. I'm never going to give up on America or Americans. Uh, I think we are a special breed. Uh, you know, a lot of people, well, I guess half the country was disheartened uh, with the election results. If they would have gone a different way, half the country would have been disheartened. And my view is it, it is not important what happens 
uh, in the White House. What's important is what happens in your house, right? So you take care of things. You set the example. You be the right person in the right world and make it so. Uh, I just last thing I'm going to say uh, again. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we look forward to our next third quarter on the Move webinar. I'll, I'll announce it tonight. It's going to be Wednesday. August 25th. Uh, it's going to start at seven o'clock and have a wonderful special guest. I thought we were going to be the first to get him back on the air after many, many years. Uh, but many of you are familiar with Chuck Butler, who's the writer of the Daily Fennig. I've known him all the way back from the Mark Twain days through Everbank. Mr. And now Silver, right? Ab absolutely. And with the Aiden sisters now, he writes the Daily Fennig every day. Uh, but Chuck Butler uh, is on the money show tomorrow uh, with the Aiden sisters on a panel. Otherwise, we might have been the first to get him back out there live, but we'll have him August 25th and, and uh, Chris Blasi will be back with us then as well. I know we missed tonight's discussion. Mark, thank you. Everybody listening, thank you. Uh, it was wonderful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. All right. Take care.